Good morning, everybody. Um, welcome to the show. And um, I'll be doing the news this morning. And then I'm going to hand over to uh, Matt, who's going to um, be the interviewer for our guest this, this week, which is uh, Carlos Hardenberg from Mobis Investment Trust. So um, I've got a few bits of news to pick up on. Um, I've obviously been away for a couple of weeks, so plenty has been going on. Um, so it was it's a bit miserable, so I wanted to have a good news story. So that's Gulf Investments. And then we're going to talk about Digital Nine Hickel, which actually is probably good news too, and hypnosis. So Gulf First, um, it is doing very well and trading at asset value. Um, they're one of very few funds now that's doing that. The, the number of funds that are trading at asset value or premiums is actually quite small, less than 10% of the whole universe. Um, so this fund, the reason it's doing so well is because it is performing extremely well, as we're going to come on to. It's focused on the Gulf states um, of Bahrain, Kuwait, et cetera. Um, and it's the only fund that um, is available that, that does this in a kind of pure form. And these are an increasingly important part of the market, which we talked about before. So it's um, now 7% of the MSCI emerging. Obviously, oil and gas prices are a big driver of what happens with the uh, local economies. But um, they are trying to reposition those, knowing that net zero is coming. And, and obviously, we're going to be using um, less and less of this in the future. And they're trying to develop different bits of their economies. So for example, Saudi Arabia is spending an awful lot of money on uh, infrastructure for tourism um, and reckons it might be able to get 100 million tourists a year by 2030. And they're also pouring money into special projects. They're creating special economic zones, that have some tax breaks and visa breaks and um, allow 100% foreign ownership, for example. Um, and they're They've also got some really enormous kind of mega building projects. Um, Neom is obviously the, the uh, most well-known one, the sort of city, linear city in the desert thing. But actually, as part of that, it was interesting the other day, um, they are building, they, they, they could spend £8 billion on a, a hydrogen plant. And we were talking to Hydrogen One the other day. Uh, it was one of the projects that, that has been given the go-ahead recently. So it's one of the, the big increases in the sector. Um, there's all sorts of stuff going on. And Q8 is spending a fortune just um, trying to revegetate a large part of the country, um, I guess using desalinated water. Um, but there's all sorts of stuff going on. And there are quite a lot of IPOs. So that just gives the managers quite a lot of um, things to invest in. Um, in terms of the portfolio, it is sort of split around the region. They don't necessarily have exposure to all markets. They definitely don't have exposure to all stocks. There's, there are a whole swathe of things that they just won't buy. Um, the biggest investment there is uh, in the energy sector, so Qatar tra gas transport, and that's a transport that's a long-standing investment. But um, it's pipelines, not actual production. Um, and um, let's say everything else is really about the domestic economies. And they're quite active um, in terms of what they're doing. Um, and it's been, as I say, very successful. It offers a, a yield, which is um, quite attractive. So it's based on 4% of NAV, but actually there's a decent yield in some of these markets as well. Um, so that there is sort of natural income there. You can buy it in sterling form, uh, although it does trade in dollars normally. There's no gearing because the markets are quite volatile. The manager thinks that would add too much to the volatility. Um, it's too small. This is the only sort of real drawback, but it is growing. So it issued um, 825,000 shares the last 12 months. Um, and we're hoping that it's going to carry on doing that. And it ought to be an awful lot bigger, I think. Um, part of the reason it's small is because it does let you get out at NAV. Um, and there's also a continuation vote this year. I don't think there's going to be probably a continuation vote. I think it'll sell through. The last couple of tender offers haven't really much taken up either, because obviously, if you can destroy your asset value, you can just sell it in the market if you want to. Um, so, yeah, I think it's actually probably set fair. The only negative, and people bang on and on and on about fees and the ongoing charge ratio, yeah, 1.89% is a bit high. But think about that in the context of what it's just done in terms of the results. So the NEV there, up 20.4% for 12 months to end of June, 21.7% um, percentage points ahead of the benchmark. So 
the fact that you're paying 1.89 in fees, maybe sort of about sort of 0.9 higher than it should be, um, if it was a decent sized fund. Um, it, it really, you know, it's it's chicken feed in the scale of the, the outperformance it's achieving. And, and that frustrates me that so many people fixate on costs and not on uh, the total returns available. But there we go. Um, there, is, there is quite a big disparity in terms of the returns of individual, market, individual markets, as you see there, just over the past year, and quite a lot of volatility within the index. So it's important that they do trade around stuff and you do see a fairly amount of um, turnover. And so, obviously, you need a good manager to do that. This is definitely an actively managed fund. Uh, you couldn't get these sorts of returns, obviously, from uh, buying an ETF because you'd end up with the index return. Um, and so, it might be slightly unknown that the manager is stepping down. Uh, he's going to retire at the end of the year. But we don't actually think that's a problem. Um, the new manager has been working with him um, for a, over a decade, I think, um, and um, working on the fund for a number of years as well. I think seven. So, and there's also a very big uh, research team which isn't changing. So I, I don't think, it's, I think it's going to be business as usual, as I was saying, and I, I think it's actually one that um, might be interesting. So there's a, there's a good fund. Um, Digital Nine now, something completely opposite. <laughs> um, and we're really talking about this fall here that happened in the last couple of days, uh, and the discount's gone even wider. So they announced their interim results that NEV went down by 8.8%. Uh, it won't pay a dividend in uh, for this scheduled now. Um, and that is the thing that's most shocked investors, really, because very, even very recently, they were saying that they, there was no need to um, cut dividend payments um, and they could just carry on going until um, dividends were covered through by natural earnings. Uh, it wouldn't make much difference either way. Um, however, the, the main problem with this fund is that it's very extremely cash constrained and it, it sort of um, leverage is maxed out. Um, and to address that, they had planned just to sell a slice of uh, one of the uh, companies that they own, which is Vern Global, which is a data center company, uh, which has um, subsidiaries in Iceland and Finland and the UK, um, and that is just growing like mad. Um, but that, that is, as, as we'll talk about, is part of the problem. Um, so that was supposed to happen in Q3, and they're now saying that's going to happen in Q4. So, so that creates a sort of hole in the planned cash flow. Um, given that they've had this sort of shock, uh, unsurprisingly, they are going to talk to shareholders about what's going on. Uh, that chair of consultation is supposed to kick off on the 2nd of October. And it will focus on dividend policy, but also the future strategic direction of the company. And this is, I think, is the, the crucial thing because you actually you just look at this and say, this is all horrible. Let's just wind it up. I don't think that's necessarily a good idea. Um, in terms of the NAV move, most of the impact has come from FX, uh, and that is strongest earning, uh, so um, weighing on their dollar returns. Uh, there were no big moves in the underlying valuations. This slide is on their website, but wasn't used in the presentation, which seems a bit strange. Uh, and it does look as though here there's been a big fall in the value of Vern, but actually most of that, almost all, well, a large chunk of that re reflects um, a repayment of capital from Vern up to the top code. So they, they've repaid 39 million of a uh, 50 million pound loan. Um, so that's why the the uh, investment in the global license has, has gone down. Um, and that cash is what's keeping the whole thing going at the moment. Um, um, but I was, it's not really possible to carry on doing that. So there was a small hit in the valuation of that, but it really is it's just the FX things we were talking about before. Um, the leverage, is, as I say, is too high. Um, so the ratio of debt to the Cash earnings, EBITDA, is 6.2 times, which is on the high side, um, maybe. Um, but the main problem is that there's this, like this enormous CapEx um, bill that they've got. So I think thinking that they could just carry on issuing equity more and more and more equity and fund it all that way, that the previous managers just committed to uh, a wide range of stuff. 
that that was never going to be financed sustainably. They had to raise more money to do it. That's obviously not possible given where the discount is. So they've got to do different things. Uh, the new manager that they've they brought in from outside, he's sort of getting to grips with it now. He's saying we've got to accelerate this deed over entry process, and that's one of the reasons why they've decided to suspend the dividend. They've also got uh, an inflation linked loan in uh, Arkiva, which is the uh, telecom uh, towers in the UK, um, and that is a sort of nasty piece of debt that they could really do without. They have managed to cap the co- the uh, rate by which the inflation marches up every year. So that's now in the cap and collar of between 6% and 5%. So what it does mean is that even if RPI drops below five, which we obviously hope it will do, then that loan is still marching upwards, which is not great. And there was a cost to that in terms of cash. Um, and that too has been further strain on the balance sheet. So Vern is the sort of big success story. And as they say, uh, almost too successful. It now needs £610 million pounds of capex. Uh, that's up from 493 at the beginning of the year. And they are uh, heavy hints that that number is still rising. Um, and that's because it's just got way, you know, it's way more customers than it um, can handle. It needs to keep on developing new data centers. DGI clearly can't fund all of this. Uh, and it has. Um, 100% of the company. So it's looking at selling a stake. And it was looking at selling a slice of the thing. It's now saying uh, we may be looking at selling a majority of the company or a co controlling sense of 50% stake. And the good news is, even though this is clearly uh, desperate to, to sell this, uh, there is a competitive process. So they have got multiple bids in. So that should mean that they, they do achieve a reasonable price for it. They're saying something close to NEV. Uh, I think that's slightly disappointing. Some people thought they might get a premium to NAV, given how fast it's growing. And they probably are destroying value by doing this, but there, there's no real way around uh, what they're doing for destroying future value. So um, they, they need to get this done. And it was they were asked on the call whether um, they might think about saying the whole thing. I think they don't want to do that because of the growth of the company. They see this as, as great investment going forward. Obviously, there's a possibility that somebody come around with a knockout bid. Um, so actually, just to conclude on this before we go, the share price has dived. Obviously, investors are extremely upset. I can imagine that there'll be a lot of people just saying, oh, this is just stupid, just walking this thing up. I'm so frustrated. I think it's actually probably a screaming buy. <laughs> but, um, and I might put my money where my mouth is. Um, uh, obviously, I'll tell you this now before I do the dealing, which is the, the right way to do stuff. Um, it seems to me quite likely that they're going to be able to get this burn thing done. Um, and that will free up an awful lot of cash. That, that will allow them to sort out a lot of the balance sheet. Um, it may even allow them to do some bad bikes, but we'll have to wait and see on that. Um, and I, I do think, for the most part, these are these are reasonably quite quite reasonably good investments. Um, so, what we could be seeing is a bottom end of the share price fall here. So, Hickle, very similar sort of story uh, in that it's completely derated, uh, and it's also selling stuff to prove the nav. So, it's just sold. 204 million pounds worth of assets. There's about 6% of the portfolio to John Lang. Uh, it's a whole bunch of PFI type things that he's held for ages and a stake in one of the um, offshore transmission connections, the one for Hornsea Wind Farm. Um, it sold small premium to NAV, which is a big tick in the box in terms of trying to prove that the NAV is okay. And they're going to use the money to cut debt, which is obviously the debt's been quite expensive as, as the uh, reference rate's been rising up because this is a floating rate debt. So it's a good idea to get rid of it if they can. Um, and I think, again, they would have assumed that they'd run up the RCF and just issue more equity. That's what they've been doing for years and years and years. And now it's not possible. So this thing's gone to a 25% plus discount. Um, this sort of trade proves that that nav is not too far out. Um, I don't really like Affinity Water, which is his biggest investment, but that doesn't mean it's it's not worth the, the value that they've got there. I mean, there might be a small haircut, but it definitely doesn't explain that. It's only 7% of the portfolio anyway. 
Um, this just looks to me like the wrong price. There we go. Uh, I'm going to win out and then finish up on hypnosis. Um, now, again, with this is a tale of woe. We, um, I wasn't here, but we, we've talked about the um, plan to sell fifth of the portfolio to a related party at the wrong price. Huge transfer of value from shareholders to the related parties. Understandably, shareholders are extremely upset. Um, and um, the votes for these things are coming up. So uh, there's an AGM and an EGM set the 6th of October. Um, I think it's possible that shareholders will vote against the re-election of the directors. There's also a pretty good chance that shareholders will vote against continuation, I think. Um, We'll have to wait and see. They're obviously just making concession, concession, concession in the attempt to save that up, save that off. I definitely think if you are a shareholder, you, you should be voting against this idea at the EGM. Um, uh, just reject this. It's, it's just the wrong price um, and make them come back with a better offer or try and find a different buyer for the portfolio. Um, they are trying to do that. So they do say there are credible third party bids already engaged. And, and if they come in at a higher price than the managers and the uh, Blackstone people have offered, then um, th those people will buy the things instead. Um, and obviously there's nothing we can really do. If it's not a related practice transaction, they can just go ahead and do that because uh, it's like a normal portfolio thing. Um, again, if it's at a big haircut, then that really calls into question the validity of the NEV. Um, so there, there are questions to be asked there. And that's, again, I think that still means the chair is going to be unhappy. The chair's now said he's going to step down. Um, they've introduced more continuation votes. Uh, that's probably a good thing, um, given what's going on. The key thing, though, is this idea that uh, if they can't sort the discount out by January 2025, then the manager's going to get kicked out. Um, Obviously, they'll still get 12 months notice, so they'd still be running the fund for the whole of 2025. I don't know that that's good enough, really. Uh, to it wouldn't be, I'm going to vote against the, the deal, um, and I'm thinking about voting its continuation as well. So that's the end of me.